thank you ISHB team for uh, having me here for the master class. So uh, today's topic is approach to thrombocytopenia, and ISHB team is actually uh, the body which uh, it is an Indian Society of uh, Hematology and Blood Transfusion where uh, it is an effort to bring about awareness and to teach the students, the DM residents, the DMB residents, as well as the fellows regarding the basics of what hematology is and how we try to deal with this uh, intricacies when we are dealing the patient of uh, hematology or a case of hematology. So today's discussion is approach to thrombocytopenia. This will be a one hour class. And post the lecture, if anybody, anybody has any questions, they can put it in the chat box or they can ask it directly. Yeah, so outline of the topic, we will have the definition, what is thrombocytopenia, the pathogenesis, why it occurs, how we approach a case of thrombocytopenia, what are the lab investigations we need to know in order to arrive at a diagnosis, management of thrombocytopenia in different clinical scenarios, and there are special circumstances where we need to put special effort for these patients like neonatal thrombocytopenia and the thrombocytopenia in pregnancy. So as we move ahead, thrombocytopenia is defined as a platelet count below lower limit of normal. That is, if we look into the literature or a lab value, then less than 1.5 lakhs for adults is what is defined as thrombocytopenia. And the degrees are variable like mild, moderate, and severe. Mild is something which ranges between 1 lakh to 1.5 lakh and for us as hematologists, it is almost normal. Moderate is 50 to 1 lakh and severe is less than 50,000. Uh, 50, so in ITP, we find patients who have usually less than 30,000 platelet counts where we need to intervene in case of adults and it is still less in case of the pediatric patients, less than 10,000 or only if the patient is bleeding. But however, it is always not that these absolute values are of importance. A recent fall in the platelet count by more than 50% should definitely raise a clinician or a hematologist a suspicion regarding something probably is going on and following a day or a two, the count will, the platelet count will still fall down. So epidemiology, whenever we look into the epidemiology, there are less data from India or from Asian countries and mostly we have to depend upon the Western data. And similarly, this is something known as NHANES database where they have found that there is slightly, the platelet counts are slightly higher in the women because possibly women have iron deficiency as a result of which they have more amount of the platelets, reactive thrombocytosis. It is slightly higher in younger people than the older, and it is higher in the non-Hispanic uh, black as compared to the white individuals. And platelet counts, which range from 1.5 to 4.5 lakhs, there is a little bit variation between the females and the males. It is, as we discussed, it is a little bit higher, 2.6, and it is somewhat a little bit lower, like 2.37 in case of males. So starting at how this platelet production occurs, then we will know that how the destruction occurs as a result of which there is either less production or increased destruction resulting in thrombocytopenia or the low platelet count. So as we are aware, from the myeloid stem cell, the megakaryoblasts arise and then they differentiate further and proliferate further to produce megakaryocytes. And from the megakaryocytes, the platelets are derived. So platelet production, we know that each megakaryocyte produces approximately 1,000 to 5,000 platelets. And the rate of platelet production is 35,000 to 50,000 platelets per microliter of blood daily at steady state. Production can increase up to eightfold during times of increased demand. So the body is made up in such a way that whenever there is a decrease in the platelet count, we know that it is 4.5 lakhs is the upper limit, but then a patient does not bleed even at a platelet count of 10,000 or 30,000. So these are the cases where we know that even though the counts which are required to maintain a normal hemostasis is only 30,000, but still God has given us something to have it as 1.5 or 1 point, uh, more than 1.5 lakh. So that was the regarding the platelet production. Next, platelet destruction. Like we have RBCs, WBCs, similarly, platelets also survive for a definite period in the circulation and that is from eight to 10 days. How are they removed then from the system? Mostly by the monocytes, the macrophages, which make up the reticular endothelial system and sometimes by apoptosis. Accelerated destruction of platelets occur when there is antibody-mediated clearance. 
and that occurs in case of ITP. So when we find a patient of immune thrombocytopenia, they usually present at a count of less than 10,000 and the counter that, that is a CBC counter, it produces or uh, it gives a count approximately 1,000, 2,000. And this is something which has not been there for a prolonged time, but it is sudden or acute onset. So that is what means that antibody, whenever it is an antibody mediated clearance or destruction of the platelets, it occurs within few hours or few days. So having said that the platelet counts even at 30,000 does not bleed, the, uh, the patients with 30,000, they do not bleed. Do we need to worry about bleeding in a patient of platelet counts who have low platelet counts? So more important is whenever as a hematologist you are practicing, you will get a referral from the surgery department that this patient has a platelet count of 80,000 and we need a clearance for the surgery. Sometimes it is an immediate surgery, sometimes it is an elective surgery. So there are different circumstances where you can wait or you can allow the patient to be taken up for the procedure. So surgical bleeding may be allowed with platelet counts more than 50,000 because hemostasis can be very well achieved at this count. However, neurosurgery, major cardiac surgery, orthopedic surgery, where the bleeding is very high, in those cases, you have to at least take it more than 1 lakh. Mind it, it should not always be more than 1.5 lakh. For small procedures like cataract, dermatologic, bone marrow procedures, more than 30,000 is sufficient. And even for bone marrow, there are patients when they come and bleed with ITP patients, where even after transfusion, the platelet counts do not increase. In those patients, we can even do it at a count of 10,000, 20,000. Severe spontaneous bleeding occurs only when the counts fall to less than 10,000. But apart from the counts, we also need to look into what are the platelet function defects and whether the patient has other coagulation abnormalities because these also contribute to the bleeding apart from the count of the platelets. There are some rare inherited disorders where thrombocythemia is something, platelet function abnormalities are known as thrombocythemia. We have some cases like bernard soldier syndrome where there is thrombocytopenia as well as impaired platelet function. And in these cases, you will see that a platelet count, patient may have a platelet count of 60,000, but then they are bleeding. And these are the time points where we need to think and ponder over whether the patient has an impaired platelet function. Similarly, in cases of liver disease and in DIC, where coagulopathies coexist, in those cases, the patient may bleed disproportionately as compared to the total platelet count. So other factors also need to be kept in mind. So as we discussed, decreased production, that is the thrombopoietin, which is the stimulant for platelet production if it is decreased, as we know in cases of aplastic anemia in MDS and in chemotherapy-induced thrombocytopenia, there is a decreased production of the platelets, increased destruction as occurs in cases of antibody-mediated destruction or in consumption like ITP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura in DIC. Sequestration as occurs in congestive splenomegaly. Spleen is a site where a lot of cooling of the platelets occur. And as we saw that whenever there is an increase in the requirement of the platelets, the counts may be increased eight times fold higher. So that is sequestration in congestive splenomegaly when the spleen is uh, enlarged, there is a lot of sequestration of the platelets inside the spleen. And then hemodilution, which occurs in cases of road traffic accident whenever or in a case of PPH where there will be massive hemorrhage and the patient will be flooded with the blood products like PRBCs, FFPs, but many a times people forget or the physicians forget to transfuse platelets in adequate amount in order to maintain a hemostasis. So that occurs when there is hemodilution. So this is how there should, whenever there is increased amount of destruction or decreased amount of production, then the platelet counts may decrease and may result in thrombocytopenia. So after having understood about the pathogenesis, next important is to understand the clinical history of the patient. And this is most important, not only for thrombocytopenia, but any patient approaching to you, be it, uh, be it a medicine case or be it a surgical case, Clinically, you have to assess what your patient is undergoing or what symptoms the patient has. And accordingly, then you list down what are the investigations you need to perform on that patient. So family history, as we discussed, there are some congenital thrombocytopenias and thrombocythemias which run in the family. So a girl may have her mother also presenting with menorrhagia and a low platelet count, as in case of von Willebrand disease. Duration of onset, Acute, chronic, and relapsing, as we go further, we will know that there are some diseases like ITPs, 
immune thrombocytopenia, they may have an acute presentation. They may be chronic. Some ITPs relapse very frequently, whereas others, they just spontaneously get remitted. Disease history, immune thrombocytopenia, secondary to or other autoimmune disorders, viral infections like hepatitis C infection causes thrombocytopenia, malignancies, wherever there is a marrow infiltration. These are some of the these underlying diseases which may reflect a low platelet count in the peripheral blood. Pregnancy, we have a, uh, we have a session on pregnancy, recent medications, vaccinations, travels which result in malaria or endemic areas like rickettosis, dengue fever, recent transfusions, post-transfusion purpura, something happens and that is transfusion related, organ transplantation, uh, be it hematopoietic stem cell or solid organ transplant, infections, retroviral HIV infection or viral hepatitis, and ICU again, thrombocytopenia in ICU, it's itself a great topic which we need to discuss. So the most common causes of thrombocytopenia, there are some patients whom you will attend in the OPD and some patients you will have call as in patients who are in the ICUs and these are the common referrals a hematologist get in the, uh, in the indoors. So OPD patients, you will have immune thrombocytopenia, drug-induced infections, connective tissue disorders or autoimmune disorder, vaccination, MDS, congenital thrombocytopenia and common variable immunodeficiency. Inpatient, when you find ICU is the good stuff, infections causing sepsis, ETP or HUS, drug-induced thrombocytopenia, DIC, liver disease, HIT, this is macrophage activation syndrome, bone marrow disorders, chemotherapy-induced thrombocytopenia. In cardiac patients, mostly you will find heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, cardiac bypass, where a lot of platelets get pulled in the circuit, glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors, which cause drug-induced thrombocytopenia, and dilutional when the patient is having bleeds, patient is given, has been given blood products apart from the platelet transfusion. Pregnancy, again a very important part, gestational thrombocytopenia, ITP health, preeclampsia, abruptio, and TTP or HUS. So, First, when the patient presents with bleeding or he complains, he or she complains of bleeding, we need to differentiate whether it is because of the primary hemostasis or it is because of the secondary hemostasis. So whenever there is primary hemostasis, we means the platelet plug formation. So platelet, the number of the platelets or the function of the platelets is important in these cases. And what we find is whenever there is a platelet problem or there is a platelet function defect, the latency of the bleeding, you will find it is immediate onset, whereas in secondary hemostasis, because the primary platelet plug has been already formed, secondary hemostasis, it is delayed onset. Fatigue more common with platelet dysfunction or low platelet count, it is almost absent in the secondary hemostasis. Achymosis, deep, uh, achymosis and fatigue more common with platelet disorders. Hematomas, hematrosis, they are more common with the factor deficiencies or the coagulation abnormalities. Mucosal bleeding common with uh, platelet disorders, epistaxis common with the platelet disorders, menorrhagia common with the platelet disorders. So these are the, this is one of the way you can differentiate clinically regarding whether there is a platelet bleed or there is a coagulation bleed. So next after having the physical examination and the clinical history taken, be advised for a smear examination because that is what will give you an idea regarding what type of platelets you are having the uh, you are having in the smear so sometimes there might be pseudothrombocytopenia sometimes the platelet morphology will be abnormal sometimes you will get the platelet number is adequate but still the patient is bleeding so these are something which we need to understand a good morphologist should look into your slide even for a patient of itp which does not have any direct test to say that a patient is having ITP, you have to exclude other causes by looking into the peripheral smear. So it is of utmost important, importance. So in ITP, you can see the platelets are almost not there, but a single giant or a good looking platelet is there. These giant platelets are usually very active platelets. And therefore in ITP, the patients do not bleed even though the, the platelet counts are almost less than 5,000. DIC, you can see a number of fragmented cells over here. TTP, also a hemolysis, a thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Hemolysis is very evident over here. Cystiocytes, you can see. DIC and TTP are almost, they have the same look, but then in DIC, you will have some toxic granulations, some changes in the, uh, uh, some changes in the WBC series because the patient mostly have sepsis also associated with them. 
In DTP, you will find cystocytes. Number of cystocytes is very important because that is how you monitor a response when you start treating a patient of DTP and there is very low platelet count. Malaria, as we said, infective etiology. So malaria can have a broad manifestation from all sorts of hematological uh, uh, problems to the systemic uh, problems. Then MDS, you will find some amount of dysplastic features in the uh, myeloid series. In HLH, sometimes when the HLH, that is uh, hemophagocytic lipohistiocytosis, in some patients you will find even in the peripheral blood, there will be active hemophagocytosis or macrophage activity will be very much elevated in the marrow. In AML, acute myeloid leukemia or acute lymphoid leukemia or lymphomas involving the bone marrow, in those cases, you can find atypical cells in the peripheral blood. And you can see as in the background, there are hardly any platelets which can be appreciated. Hypoplastic anemia or aplastic anemia, where the, there is a bone marrow failure, the, uh, the bone marrow is not able to produce any of the cells in all the lineages. That is, RBC content is low, platelets are low, as well as the TLC or the WBCs are also low. So something which is known as pseudothrombocytopenia, you will find that the lab reports that we need a fresh secret sample. So many a times in EDTA, there are some naturally occurring antibodies which go, which uh, cause the agglutination of the platelets as a result of which they get clumped within the test tube. So when the test tube is run in the counter, these clumps are not read by the machine. And as a result of which the platelet counts will falsely appear low in the counter uh, report. But when you make a smear of it, you can find that there are clumps of platelet like this over here. And you say that whenever these clumps are present, the, uh, possibly the count of the platelet is more than one lakh. So that should also be kept in mind. So we discussed about the platelet clumping, the platelet size, the granularity, morphology of the platelets. So, uh, and also in uh, there are some inherited uh, uh, marrow failure syndromes like Viscot Aldrich syndrome, x linked thrombocytopenia, which is because of the vast gene, where you can find the platelets are not only less in number, but they are also small in size and they are also dysfunctional platelets. So we talked about how we look into the WBCs we discussed about the MDS, how to suspect an MDS, how to suspect the uh, aplastic anemia cases, leukemia cases. So this is also a part of it. So RBC morphology, WBC morphology, platelet morphology, all of them are important, rather very, very important in order to next go for a advice for the next investigation so that we do not land up doing a lot of investigations, but rather be precise and to the point regarding what we are dealing with. So having said that, this is how the algorithm is regarding the approach to thrombocytopenia. Most important is examine the peripheral blood smear. Platelet clumping, if it is artifactual, just repeat it again through thrombocytopenia. Look into the cystocytes, find some hemolysis, then these are the things you have to consider. Blast cells and abnormalities within the myeloid series, primary or bone marrow disorder, go ahead with a bone marrow aspiration and a biopsy. If there are again signs of hemolysis and platelet clumping or uh, sorry, RBC clumping and agglutination are present, think of some autoimmune disorders, Ivan syndrome, where there is autoimmune hemolytic anemia as well as autoimmune thrombocytopenia, go ahead with a direct Holmes test. Reticulocyte count is very essential to know the amount of hemolysis going on along with corroboration with LDH and the LFT. Look into the lymphocytes and the neutrophils. If you consider an infection or atypical lymphocytes because of some viral infection or because of leukemias. So go ahead with the further tests regarding that. And isolated thrombocytopenia, most common disorder is IDP or drug-induced thrombocytopenia. Apart, of, apart from that, we look into other etiologies and these we will come subsequently based upon the type, uh, based upon the suspicion we have regarding what next to do, investigate accordingly. Hereditary thrombocytopenia, sometimes we have giant platelets, plus minus uh, the WBC inclusions like the dual bodies, which tell us that the patient may have some inherited condition. So these are the, just to name the inherited conditions, von Willebrand disease type 2, not all von Willebrand, but the type 2B, Biscot Aldrich syndrome, Alport syndrome, Mayheglin anomaly, Fankini anemia, most common among them, Bernard Solier syndrome, we do find patients of BSS, and then thrombocytopenia with absent radius and syndrome. So this is a whole lot of hereditary thrombocytopenias which we need to understand and treat 
in subsequent classes on aplastic anemics. So RBC is also we discussed. So just is it that uh, whenever we are dealing a case of thrombocytopenia, is it already always necessary that the patient should bleed? It is not so. We need to worry about the thrombosis as well when the patients have low platelet counts. And most of the times when we get referrals, it is usually a patient with thrombocytopenia as well as an infarct, which helps us to find out that what are the conditions in which the platelets are low, but still they are so active that they become thrombogenic. So it is a list of five, that is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, vaccine-induced immune thrombocytopenia, APLA syndrome, PNH. So these are the conditions in which you will find thrombocytopenia as well as thrombosis. So starting with the heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, it is one of the most common things which you have to suspect when you're getting a referral from an ICU and a patient is put on heparin as a thromboprophylaxis. So what happens is heparin, which is nothing but a protein, platelet factor 4, which is present in the platelets, they combine and form the heparin platelet factor 4 complex. This causes the formation of antibodies, anti-heparin and platelet factor 4 IgG antibody. This antibody goes and binds to the complex, taken up by the FC receptor, and as a result of which, you will find that there will be uh, activation of the platelets and the macrophages, they are uh, destroying these platelets. So platelet activation occurs as well as platelet destruction also occurs. As a result, in these cases, if we are uh, supporting the patients with more amount of platelets from outside, that is platelet transfusion is being uh, given, then these patients will end up in having more amount of thrombosis because they, the patients are producing the platelets, but the platelets are getting destroyed. So the more amount of platelets you are giving, the more amount of, uh, the more you're triggering the underlying pathogenesis of thrombosis. So we have to be very careful regarding when to transfuse a patient of hit with thrombosis as well as bleeding. So hit probability assessment is again a clinical assessment where you suspect that the patient may have hit, that is known as the 4T score. That depends upon thrombocytopenia, timing of the platelet count, decrease, thrombosis or sequelae, and other causes of thrombocytopenia. You have to see and you have to exclude. So there are points to it, 2, 1, and 0. If a point of 6 to 8 comes, it has a very high probability that the patient is having it, and subsequently you go on investigating. Like there are some assays, ELISA tests and the assays to determine and prove that the patient has hit. 4 to 5 is intermediate, patient may have hit, may not have hit, 0 to 3, it is low probability of hit. So you can go through the chart later on. Then management of hit. So what is the importance? Why? How do you manage a patient of hit and why it is important? First and foremost, discontinue heparin if you are suspecting hit and the 4T score says that it is either intermediate or high risk of hit. Then start a non-heparin anticoagulant according to the ASH guidelines. Patients who are critically ill, having an increased bleeding risk or increased potential to need for an urgent procedure, go for argatroban or bivaluridin. Why? Because it has a shorter duration of action so that you, if, when you stop the drug immediately, you decrease the, ble uh, the bleed or you can take the patient for a procedure. Fondaparanox is the drug of choice in patients with renal failure. Patients who are clinically stable can be taken up for Fondaparanox or Duag. DOAC is something which is not yet in strong recommendation because they are, it is only given because it has lacks the need for lab monitoring and the ease of administration. But many a times, DOACs may not be a proper anticoagulant also because patients who are critically ill, they may not be able to take a drug orally. Only for clinically stable patients, DOAC may be used. Life-threatening or limb-threatening thrombosis, you go for arcatroban, bivaloridin, danaparoid or fondaparanox. And patients with moderate or, hepat, uh, moderate or severe hepatic di uh, dysfunction avoid DOAX and avoid argatroban. The drug of choice is usually fondaparanox or uh, fondaparanox. So as we discussed about HIT, next is the very important thing which uh, we talked about last year or last two years, the vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia. So in late February 2021, a prothrombotic syndrome was reported in individuals who received the vaccines from AstraZeneca, from the Serum Institute of India, and from Janssen, that is Johnson & Johnson. So what was common to all the three vaccines? 
these vaccines were adenoviral vector vector based vaccine so the incidence actually is not uh, it is not very common it is rare but it is also not well documented what is the incidence but what happened there was mass vaccination going around throughout the world as a result of which even two or three cases which propped up they were also significant at that point of time because they occurred at a single time point so therefore the incidence cannot exactly be said what is the incidence but then we understand that we, we should know that what is with and how it is to be managed so the pathogenesis we have a good diagram on that here again you can see adenoviral vector vaccine causes pro inflammatory milieu caused by the vaccine components the platelet factor 4 is released from the platelets these together form a complex they enter into the lymph nodes then there is some priming and the memory b cells they will produce some antibodies these antibodies again go and attack the platelets and with the fc gamma receptor on the monocytes they are again phagocytous and not only this but they bring about thrombosis by recruiting the neutrophils and, and the other pro coagulant particles which are present with the exposure of the tissue factor resulting in thrombosis uh, thrombosis so similar to that of hit almost the pathophysiology of wit is also similar and we can we have seen that many patients even in our icus we had calls where patients had thrombosis typically females with cerebral vein thrombosis and isolated thrombocytopenia post vaccination and that is when we think or keep differential bit also as a probability so here again evaluation is by the 4t score as that of hit routine however routine platelet count and d dimer testing followed covid 19 vaccine is not advised because the incidence is very very less cbc pt aptt fibrinogen d dimer has to be done to rule out dic thrombosis needs to be documented by imaging and do a testing for the sars cov2 cov2 positive peer platelet factor 4 antibody testing by elisa and functional test is confirmatory as we do for hit rapid hit tests are unreliable and should be avoided because here we are not looking into the platelet factor 4 which has been induced by the hit but uh, by the heparin but it is induced by the viral vaccine other causes of thrombocytopenia and thrombosis needs to be excluded on this so management includes anticoagulation again over here also a non heparin anticoagulant rather than heparin is the drug of choice immunoglobulin can be given at a high dose 1 g per kg for approximately 2 days plasma exchange if both these do not work then you can go for a plasma exchange only if the patient is critically bleeding then only you go for a platelet transfusion or else platelet transfusions are contraindicated people who have recovered this was again a question over there because we needed two doses of uh, booster doses for the vaccination people who have recovered from wit should not receive another adenoviral vectored vaccine however an mrna vaccine may be safe in such cases where you think that you definitely need to vaccinate your patient so next again thrombocytopenia with thrombosis the third spectrum is the anti phospholipid antibody syndrome it is an autoimmune multi system disorder characterized by thromboembolic events both in the atrial as well as the venous system and or it may be associated with pregnancy morbidity in the presence of persistent anti phospholipid antibodies so aps occurs as a primary condition or it may occur more commonly as an underlying system with a underlying systemic autoimmune disease like sle it can involve any part of the body it is a systemic disorder right starting from the brain till the thrombosis in the legs along with the pregnancy complication so important to know how do you diagnose a case of uh, anti phospholipid syndrome we have a revised saparo aps classification or sydney criteria which states that a patient who meet at least one of the clinical criteria and at least one of the lab criteria can be diagnosed as a case of aps so clinical criteria includes vascular thrombosis on uh, includes the vascular thrombosis and the pregnancy morbidity vascular thrombosis means one so one or more episode of venous arterial or small vessel thrombosis in any tissue or organ with unequivocal Im imaging or histologic evidence of thrombosis and pregnancy mortality means one or more unexplained deaths of a morphologically normal fetus at more than 10 week of gestation or one or more premature birth of a morphologically normal neonate each word is important over here 
less than 34 weeks of gestation because of eclampsia, preeclampsia, or placental insufficiency, or three or more consecutive spontaneous pregnancy losses at less than 10 weeks of gestation unexplained by chromosomal abnormalities or maternal problems. So the, that was the clinical criteria. The lab criteria, it should include one or more of the following antiphospholipid antibodies on two or more occasions at least 12 weeks apart. So 12 weeks because that is the time when the antibodies, if they are transient antibodies, they will go away. But if they are lupus antibodies, they will persist. So IgG and IgM for anti-cardiolipin antibody, these are the standards which are established by uh, the, uh, there are published guidelines on that. IgG and IgM anti-bitter 2 glycoprotein uh, I, and uh, this is again more than 40 GPL or MPL units and lupus anticoagulant should be detected and it should be properly done as published by the guidelines. So it has to be a standardized lab to say that the patient has APLA syndrome or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So again, here also the management, though the platelet counts are low, thrombosis is something which, has, uh, which is worrying and that is what causes the morbidity of the patients. So primary thrombosis prevention can, can be, excuse me, can be done with low dose aspirin, 75 to 100 milligram OD. Acute thrombosis management can be done with low molecular weight heparin or warfarin. Secondary thrombo, uh, thrombosis prevention, mostly with the uh, warfarin with a target INR of two to three is recommended. Aspirin and antiplatelets are given to patients who present with ischemic stroke. And then it is very important if a patient is having secondary APLA, then the autoimmune condition needs to be taken care of. And here, important to mention is DOACs do not have a good role in uh, managing the thrombosis of APLA because uh, they do not have a, a very high range of having, like, uh, you know, when a patient of uh, APLA has all the three antibodies present or the anticoagulant, lupus anticoagulant, the APLA, uh, APL antibodies, cardiolipin antibodies, they are at very high risk. And it does not, the DOACs are not proper to have a coverage for the antithrombotic profile. So after that, we come to thrombotic microangiopathy, which includes TTP, DIC, HUS, all of them. So we will have two to three slides on that. So TMAs or thrombotic microangiopathies are clinical syndromes defined by the presence of hemolytic anemia, low platelets, and microthrombi, leading to ischemic tissue injury. So TTP, HUS, and drug-induced TMAs are important. These are, one, uh, these are the causes, common causes. Microthrombi are present in the organs. Plasma exchange for TTP may be life-saving and should be initiated immediately whenever TTP is suspected. So in TTP lab findings, there is severe deficiency of ADAMPS13. In complement-mediated TMA, a lot of complement, you can see alternative complement pathway proteins. These are deficient. In HUS, Shiga toxin-mediated HUS, mostly seen in children, you can find that this toxin is present and you can diagnose them. Drug-induced TMA, you have to take in history and see which drugs the patient is taking so that you can know that it is this drug is causing the TMA. Coagulation-mediated TMA, this is again an inherited uh, problem and seen mostly in children less than one year. Then you have DIC, systemic infection like sepsis causing Again, TTP, malignancies, lot of malignancies can cause TTP. Pregnancy-related causes like health, pre severe preeclampsia, severe hypertension, severe rheumatic disease like SLE, EPS, like resulting in secondary TTPs. And then we have hematopoietic stem cell transplant where patient have, can have, because of uh, uh, it, as a complication of the transplant as such, also because of the radiation or because of the cyclosporine or the TAC, which we, uh, which we use as immunosuppressants during the treatment of the patient. Similarly, in solid organ transplant. So you can see that TMS, there are a variety of conditions. We need to understand what is the etiology and accordingly treat the patient. So last one among the causes of thrombocytopenia with thrombosis is paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. So this is again a rare condition, which is caused by the loss of glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol from the cell membrane. These uh, as a result of the loss of these uh, proteins, the stem cells and their progeny, they lose the ability to anchor to the proteins, uh, anchor certain proteins to the cell surface, as a result of which there is loss of complement inhibitors resulting in hemolysis of RBCs. Also because of the loss, some of the platelets, they have exposure of phosphatidylserine and all. 
resulting in a propensity for thrombosis. So there are conditions where you can have even a bone marrow failure that is aplastic anemia and MDS and treatment depends upon what spectrum the patient has presented in, in a case of PLH. So you can see the classic pathway, the lectin pathway, as well as the alternative pathway, all of them are affected in a patient uh, with PNH as a result of which there is intravascular hemolysis and the other aspect of it is the bone marrow failure and the thrombosis. So management, curative intent, if you go for, for a patient of PNH, it is only allogenic stem cell transplant. But we have a number of supportive treatment because most of the patients in India, they are not able to afford an allogenic stem cell transplant. So in supportive therapy, it depends if a patient is hemolyzing, you have to transfuse them with RBC, give some iron and folic acid supplement. Treat for complications like thrombosis. Prophylactic anticoagulation is necessary for all the patients who have PNH clone in them. Non-targeted therapies like steroids, though not much of use uh, by steroids, androgens, erythropoietin, high dose cyclophosphamide, prevention and treatment of the infections is required to just alleviate some of the symptoms of the patients. Immunosuppressive therapy in patients who present with aplastic anemia syndrome and targeted therapy, complement inhibition by echelosumab. The drug is not still now available in India, but, uh, we are, uh, but uh, the Indian agencies are trying to procure it and replacement of the complement regulatory proteins by the gene therapy. So that was it regarding thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. Next is important is thrombocytopenia in ICU. As we said, in the inpatient and then in the, in the OPD patients and then in the inpatients. So thrombocytopenia in ICU, if you look into the most common cause is the sepsis. And the, all contributing factors to it are the pathogens. Then we have a vessel injury that is not only by the inflammation, but also iatrogenic. Then there are a lot of there are a lot of acetylation, deacetylation going on, antibodies, DIC, hemophagocytosis, and then altered platelet function. So a lot of mechanisms actually are present when we look into drug-induced thrombocytopenia. And this is also something because a patient in ICU is put upon a lot of drugs, you have to see into it which, drug are, uh, in, uh, which drugs are susceptible to cause a bone marrow. Uh, uh, to cause a thrombocytopenia. So some of the mechanisms like bone marrow suppression, it is by the chemotherapy, the linezolate, NSAIDs, azathioprine, valproic acid. Immune mediated, a number of drugs are there. You have a list over here. You can go through the list in your textbooks or uh, through, the, uh, through some of the guidelines which are there for thrombocytopenia. Then there are drug specific antibodies, autoantibodies. We discussed about heparin induced thrombocytopenia and thrombotic microangiopathy. So that was regarding the uh, thrombocytopenia in ICU and the OPD patients. Next, the special circumstances we were talking about. Among that was the neonatal thrombocytopenia and thrombocytopenia in pregnancy. So neonatal thrombocytopenia, there are again of two types, the alloimmune thrombocytopenia and the autoimmune. Allo means from another person. Auto means from the same person. So neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia occurs when platelet the fetal platelets contain an antigen which is inherited from the father, but the mother lacks it. Means the fetus is inside the mother's womb. Father, some of the antigen of uh, the platelet antigen have been inherited from the father. Mother experiences this antigen as foreign and produces some antibodies. These mother's antibodies they land up ending into uh, ending in the uh, neonatal circulation. So during pregnancy, mother forms the IgG class of antiplatelet antibodies against the foreign antigen, which cross the placenta, destroy the fetal or the neonatal platelets that express the paternal antigen. So that is what is known as alloimmune. That means father was outside, somebody who is exposed from outside, the uh, mother does not take it as self, produces some antibodies. These antibodies cross the placenta because they are of the IgG class. That enters into the neonat system and this antibody will destroy the platelets of the neonats and cause a fall in the platelet count. So at birth, neonatal platelet counts occur less than one lakh. Platelet count typically falls in the first few days after birth, then rises over the next one to four weeks as the antibody level starts declining. So because the IgG, the, the half-life of the IgG is 
the three to four weeks. Therefore, it, when it will start declining on its own, then the platelet counts will start increasing. So how do you diagnose? Most important is clinical suspicion. Unexplained thrombocytopenia in first 24 to 48 hours of life, or if there is evidence of fetal intracranial hemorrhage, which is a dreaded complication. So that is when you suspect a case of neonatal aluminum thrombocytopenia. So how do you manage it? Urgent transfusion patient with a ICH, a child with a ICH, you have to give urgent transfusion. So neonatal dose of ABO RSD compatible and human platelet antigen 1A negative platelets are the treatment of choice in need. When there are signs of bleeding, the platelet count is less than 30,000 during the first 24 hours of life or there is evidence of ICH. In preterm infants, we keep the platelet count higher. That means at 50,000 also, you have to transfuse the platelet. If compatible platelets are not available, as I mentioned, ABORH compatible and HPA1A compatible. If this is not available, maternal platelets from which the plasma has been removed. Maternal platelets do not have the antigen. Plasma has the antibody. So plasma has to be removed. Maternal platelets from which the plasma has been removed and replaced with the donor plasma can be considered. So we have practiced this at times when we do not get this best matched platelets. High dose immunoglobulin, one gram per kg uh, into for two days seems to be an effective, uh, a, a, an effective way of management in approximately 65% of the cases. Steroids are not to be given in these uh, neonates because uh, the patients are usually sick and Obviously, steroids have their own side effects. So if they can be managed in such a way, that is the best way to get the uh, platelets uh, counts increased. So next is autoimmune thrombocytopenia. As I said, neonatal autoimmune thrombocytopenia, it is mediated by maternal autoantibodies that react with both the maternal as well as the fetal platelet. This occurs in maternal autoimmune disorders like immune thrombocytopenia and SMA. Uh, uh, if you have attended pediatric calls, many a times we find that patients of ITP, when they become pregnant, you will see that during the time of pregnancy, the platelet counts drops rapidly. And uh, when the patient, when these uh, mothers, pregnant females, they deliver, we always advise to look into the platelet count also of the child to see whether the patient has a neonatal autoimmune thrombocytopenia in the baby. So how do we manage that? Again, platelet counts, uh, if less than 30,000 need platelet transfusion, IVIG is very good. And we know that in autoimmune cases, there is a very important role of steroids. We can give methylprednisolone or prednisolone at the dose appropriate for neonates. So next is thrombocytopenia in pregnancy. Some of the causes and the relative incidence is mentioned over here. Isolated thrombocytopenia, gestational thrombocytopenia occurs in 70 to 80 percent, most common cause. Thrombocytopenia associated with systemic disorders like preeclampsia, health, acute fatty liver of pregnancy. And then there are some non-pregnancy specific causes like ITP, secondary ITP, drug-induced uh, thrombocytopenia, type 2B von Willebrand disease, congenital thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia associated with systemic disorders like TTP, SLE, APLA, viral infection, bone marrow disorders, and nutritional deficiencies like B12 deficiency. Splenic sequestration can occur in patients who have an underlying CLD. So these are the most common etiologies of thrombocytopenia in pregnancy. Whenever you are looking into a case of pregnancy with thrombocytopenia, you have to be justified in what treatment you are giving, whether the uh, pregnant lady, she needs treatment at all or not and what type of thrombocytopenia she is having. So as we said, 70% of the cases are gestational thrombocytopenia. So we should know what are the characteristics of gestational thrombocytopenia. So onset during pregnancy, mostly gestational thrombocytopenia occurs because of hemodilution by the increased plasma volume in the later phases of pregnancy as well as some amount of increased platelet clearance. So it occurs in the mid-late second trimester and the third trimester, whereas ITP can occur at any point of time. Frequency of the gestational thrombocytopenia increases as the term approaches because the dilution will be still higher, means a lot of volume of plasma is there and the platelet amounts are less. So it increases as the term approaches. Evidence of alternative etiologies, not there for, for both the causes. Platelet count in gestational, it is usually not very low more than 50,000, whereas in ITP, it can be as low as 10,000. 
thrombocytopenia outside of pregnancy you will never see in gestational but an itp patient a female with itp will have a precipitation of itp again during the pregnancy neonatal thrombocytopenia autoimmune neonatal thrombocytopenia occurs with itp postpartum resolution occurs with gestational but it may persist in itp so these are the characteristics and when you are looking into it you should know what uh, whether your patient is having a gestational thrombocytopenia or it is secondary to other causes so uh, similarly in the first second and the third trimester you will have some which are more common in which trimester this table is there also in the book you can look into that so we talked about it gestational thrombocytopenia most common followed by preeclampsia and itp and uh, gestational thrombocytopenia usually resolves after the pregnancy has been the pregnant lady has delivered so itp is also important because it is the second most common cause and what are the therapeutic options of for itp in a pregnant female because in pregnancy you know we need to avoid a number of drugs so first line therapy is iv ig and steroids we are most comfortable with steroids because in iv ig if a patient has some amount of reactions then there are chances that the patient may precipitate a labor second line of therapy combination therapy with steroids and iv ig splenectomy can be done in a second trimester other therapeutic options relatively contraindicated anti d because anti d is contraindicated because we need to have a safe level of hemoglobin before we give anti d and many many a times the you will see that preg in pregnancy patients have hemoglobin of approximately 8 to 9 so that is why it is relatively contraindicated as a thiopine and others like cyclosporine dapsone and the other group of drugs are almost not recommended or not used during uh, pregnancy so the mode of delivery in a patient of thrombocytopenia with pregnancy depends on the obstetric indication rather than on the platelet count platelet count of more than 50000 is safe for delivery the anesthesia or the neuroaxial anesthesia can be given at a platelet count of more than 80000 for gestational thrombocytopenia if the count drops less than 70 then secondary causes needs to be uh, considered because we know that in gestation it does not fall rapidly platelet transfusions are not required for low platelet counts unless the patient is bleeding this stands for everything be it in the pregnancy or be it in a normal patient uh, with thrombocytopenia there might be transient thrombocytopenia in neonates who are born to mothers with itp and less than 1% may have intracranial hemorrhage so de definitely there is some amount of increased morbidity and mortality for all patients uh, of all uh, pregnant females with thrombocytopenia but it is highest in patients who have tms and the primary goal for patients with pregnancy and thrombocytopenia the primary goal is to deliver the fetus because it may be uh, problematic for the mother as well so these are some of the microangiopathies you see in pregnancy this has been taken from how i treat uh, uh, thrombocytopenia in pregnancy it is by the ash you can go through the whole chart itself so i think we are now we will now be uh, closing our discussions and the take home message for today's classes for management of thrombocytopenia activity has to be restricted only when the patients are going for an extreme athletic uh, sports like boxing rugby and martial arts but they should be allowed to carry out normal day to day activities and other sports like swimming cycling and all anticoagulant and antiplatelet medications these again are very important because sometimes we find that the patients of thrombocytopenia they have undergone some sort of a cardiac procedure like stenting or they have a valve so in these cases you have to uh, uh, look into the risk and benefit and accordingly the anticoagulant and antiplatelet have to be given and apart from that as we discussed for heat for patients of apla in those cases you have to put the patients on antiplatelet and anticoagulant even if the platelet counts are low for them prevention of spontaneous bleeding there are guidelines to it in afebrile patients platelet count of less than 10000 should uh, trigger uh, uh, should trigger for platelet transfusion but for patients without uh, uh, with active fever infection and inflammation platelet count of 15 to 20000 should allow uh, the platelet transfusions to be taken place so this is again keynote on the platelet counts which is safe for procedures for being carried out especially the invasive procedures for neurosurgery and ocular surgery it should be more than 1 lakh for major orthopedic surgery at least more than 50000 endoscopic procedure 50 50000 to 20000 is fine 
for ball 20 to 30000 is okay for central line placement 20000 is okay that means if it is less than 20000 you need to transfuse the patient for lumbar puncture 10 to 20000 for patients with hematologic malignancies 40 to 50000 without hematologic malignancies and it can be lower threshold for patients with itp for neuraxial analgesia as we discussed for pregnancy 80000 is fine for bone marrow aspiration biopsy 10 to 20000 is sufficient so this is my last slide regarding how to approach a patient of thrombocytopenia. And just as we discussed, we already discussed regarding that, you have to look into the smear, rule out artifactual thrombocytopenia. If there is a true thrombocytopenia, look into the other three lineages, the WBC, RBCs also. And accordingly, you have to design into which category your patient falls into. And accordingly, you have to rule out and arrive at a diagnosis and treat your patient or manage your patient. So thank you for your patient hearing. It was, I suppose, just a one-hour talk.